computer is locked up and we'll wait just a minute well i'll just wait just a minute i got a packet i'll go i don't have the full packet no Yeah, that's that I got that for. Just hang on a second. Thank you. Here's where it's, here's where it locked up before. I don't know. It's not doing anything. So you're just trying to get to the packet, right? Mm -hmm. I can give you an iPod. Uh, I can the packet if you want. I, I just need it for reference, but... Yep. That's where it stops, or it doesn't, it just quits. to read this how oh I just touched on it. Good morning, everyone. It's a couple of minutes past nine. I'd like to call the McLeod County Board of Commissioners meeting to order this September 20th. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, start with the consideration of agenda items. Is there any additions or corrections? No changes, Mr. Chair. I'll entertain a motion to approve the the uh, agenda. Move, Mr. Chair. Motion made. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Nagel. Um, any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. The motion carries. Consent agenda. Is there any additions or corrections? No changes, Mr. Chair. Motion made by Commissioner Wright, seconded by Commissioner Nagel, Nagel to approve the consent agenda. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Excuse me. We have two proclamations. And... Um, I'm actually looking for a copy of them, and I guess I don't have them. Thank you. We'll start with a 4-H week proclamation. Um, this is National 4-H week, uh, McLeod County 4-H week proclamation. Whereas 4-H is America's largest youth development organization having supported almost 6 million youth across the country thus far. And whereas 4-H has helped 311 community club members and many other program participants this past year in McLeod County to become confident, independent, resilient, and compassionate leaders. And whereas 4-H is delivered, <coughs> delivered by cooperation, extension, a community of more than 100 public universities across the nation that provide experiences where young people learn by doing in hands on projects in area 
including health, science, agriculture, and citizenship. And whereas National 4-H Week showcases the incredible experiences that 4-H offers young people and highlights the remarkable 4-H youth in McLeod County who work each day to make a positive impact on those around them. And whereas 4-H network of 600,000 volunteers and 3,500 professional Professionals provides caring and supportive monitoring to all 4-H'ers, helping them to grow into true leaders. Expen expenditures and vari variators. Now, therefore, I, Doug Kruger, McLeod County Board of Commissioners Chair, do hereby proclaim October 2nd through the 8th, 2022 as 4-H week throughout McLeod County and encourage all the citizens to recognize 4-H for the significant impact it has made and continues to make by empowering youth within the skills they need to lead for a lifetime. And especially, I'll add, in McLeod County, they do an excellent job and, and, and we're very proud of our 4 Hers. Proclamation uh, being a Manufacturers Month in October 2022. Whereas manufacturing is a dynamic and robust industry, critical, crucial to health and strength of Minnesota diverse economy, and whereas manufacturing added 56 billion in Minnesota's economy in 2021, representing the second largest contribution of 14% to the state's gross domestic product by any industry and whereas manufactured imports brought 22 billion into the Minnesota economy in 2021 and whereas workers took home 23.4 billion in wages from Minnesota manufacturing jobs in 2021, the second largest total payroll among private sector industry, and whereas manufacturing jobs in McLeod County reported an average annual wage of $68,414, which is 36.6% higher than the county's overall average uh, annual wage and whereas manufacturing provides over 310,000 highly skilled well-paying jobs throughout the state which significantly contributes to Minnesota's high standard of living and economy vitality and whereas McLeod County has a strong and, and growing manufacturing industry that provides 4,530 manufacturing jobs in 2021 representing 29.4% of total jobs in, in the county. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Doug Kruger, Chair of the McLeod County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim October 2022 a Manufacturing Month in McLeod County. And having gone through those proclamations, uh, we can start out with 4-H again. So, uh, Darcy, do you gear up? Good morning, by the Good way. Good morning. Let's get this up and moving so you can see this, hopefully. Um, good morning again. Thank you for allowing us to come and speak with you and share a little bit about the summer activities that we did within our 4-H program. It's always a, a highlight of our year to have the opportunity to just come and share about 
all the incredibly awesome things that our 4-H kids do throughout the summer, especially as they're doing county fair and state fair. So with that, um, my name is Darcy Cole. I'm your 4-H extension educator here in McLeod County, um, and I've brought with me a little entourage of 4-Hers, so if you guys want to come up, I'll let them introduce themselves, uh, share their name and their club and a little bit about what they do in 4-H, and then we'll hop into things. So McKenna. So my name is McKenna Wright. This is my 11th year in 4-H, and I'm from the Acoma Acorns. And I'm also the Federation Treasurer, and next year I'll be the President. I show dairy, beef, and swine. I've shown swine at the State Fair. And something you guys might remember me from is doing the CWF trip for Washington, D.C. And something new I'm going to be doing is the National 4-H Dairy Conference. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Hi, so my name is Julia Quast. I am currently the treasurer, so she was treasurer last year, I'm treasurer now this year again. Um, so a little bit about me is I am from the Winstead Jolly Juniors 4-H program. Um, I am in FFA as well as 4-H, and I also show beef, goats, uh, sheep, and I used to show rabbits, don't as much anymore, and I do static projects like veterinary science, some needle arts, and just community activities. So. Hi, I am Shelby Lang. I am a 11-year member going on 12. Um, I am the vice president of the, of the Lynn Hustlers 4-H Club, and I'm going to be vice president this coming year. I was the secretary for the federation. Um, I show my registered black Angus beef and quarter horses along with miniature horses, so I have to get a little cart that I get to drive with them. And um, I am also a 4-H Ag Ambassador, so I get to have a lot of opportunities going up with 4-H public officials, and it's a lot of fun. My name is Shelby Swanson. I'm from the Coma Acorns 4-H Club, and I'm involved in the Dairy Project. Um, I'd like to share my favorite memory from this year. This year, we had the opportunity to have Nicole Dunne come with us to State Fair. She is a little girl with Down syndrome, and she brought her calf, Dave, so the dairy exhibitors were able to help her take care of her calf Dave and she had the awesome awesome opportunity to show at the state fair which most kids would not be able to have but 4-H gives her that opportunity. Thank you Sean. All right. Um, this year Emily Burns was our 4-H summer intern. She was a former Sibley County 4-H'er. She is um, majoring in agricultural science communications and leadership at Southwest State University. She helped plan and lead the summer programs and assisted with county fair preparations and also provided leadership to county fair round robin and herdsmanship. So this year we had nine clubs with 283 members. We also had 103 screen volunteers putting in over 11,000 hours. So our summer programming is a very big program. Some of the ones that a lot of youth enjoy is our day camps like the paint factory, and the mystery day camp, that's for sure. Otherwise, new this year, we had our dog practices and the Hutchinson School's special education summer school and the, P the first Lutheran Church Flames of Faith. Okay, so I want to highlight a few of the bigger numbers that we had in youth. Uh, the 200 that had showcased learning projects, the 111 uh, youth that showcased animal projects, and then the 169 that showcased static projects. Um, those numbers have been increasing from the last years, especially with COVID affecting them so much. You know, it's hard to present a project when there's a mask in the way, and having these numbers coming back up, you know, are really giving us hope that, you know, 4-H is really doing a lot in this community and doing a lot for kids in general when it comes to their confidence and um, speaking ability as well as, you know, being able to show off some knowledge that they've learned. Um, 
Some other bigger numbers that I would like to highlight are our horse, goat, poultry, swine, and dairy numbers um, on that first row. Um, they've increased a lot, especially the goat. I know um, I helped showing goats this year, and the barn was full. It was packed, and especially in years prior, we haven't been able to fill the barn, and this year it was literally like jam packed in there. It was awesome, and you know, walking in and out of that barn, seeing kids talk about their projects, and having you know other people ask questions and be able to have that knowledge and spread that knowledge onto the general public, it's huge, and it's awesome that us 4-H members can do that. Um, some other numbers I want to also highlight is our photo and video, our fine arts and crafts, and our cloverbud projects, especially our clo cloverbud projects because those are our younger members. Those are the members that are going to be coming up and doing this. You'll see them in about, what, five to six, seven years. They'll be talking to you guys. So those numbers increasing is huge, and it's great to have that much um, of a start in McLeod County 4-H. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about the livestock option a little bit. Um, numbers are also increasing. If you can see that whole bottom row, those are young kids that are showing their animals off and walking them in a ring, and they get to the whole sales experience. Um, that big number at the bottom, that 63,000, um, that was total earnings. So 80% of that goes to the 4-H'er, and 20% of that is coming back to the 4-H program. So that 80% that's going back to that 4-H'er, they're buying new animal, they may be buying semen, they may be buying all these things, and that's huge for where they're going in the future. And by the time they're a senior, they're able to put good money towards good animal that will hopefully do amazing at State Fair. So, yeah. So we had 43 youth livestock exhibitors, and we had 41 youth static project exhibitors, and a lot of them got purple ribbons this year. I saw a lot of increase, and we promoted them all over the Instagram and Facebook, which was really cool to see our numbers increase at the State Fair for purple ribbons. And we had five screen chaperones. And then for State Fair, we had 28 purple ribbons, 53 blue ribbons, 10 red ribbons, and seven participation ribbons, one livestock overall grand champion, nine livestock overall reserve champions, 11 livestock interview finalists, and one livestock interview winner. And that was Camry. She was from the Dairy Project, and this would be her like second or third year. So that was kind of cool for her to come in and just be that young and still be able to go that far with her knowledge. Um, livestock herdsmanship, we got first overall, and this would be our second year. Last year, they didn't notify that we got overall again, so that was kind of cool to know that we won it for the second time. Um, we got third for beef, first for dairy, first for goat consumer, education and second for swine so that's why our numbers were so high because we play so well in all of our um species and then for the dairy cattle evaluation team the senior team got fifth overall and the intermediate team got eighth overall um then we got we have two dairy showcase participants and we have two dairy raise, rising stars um, I had the opportunity to go into the Purple Ribbon Auction this year, which was amazing. It was a great experience. I never thought I'd be able to experience something like that. And it was with my own, it was from my own farm, so I had to do the raising, I did the breeding, I did the feeding for that animal, which was really great. Um, I, the, for the beef numbers, we had 534 total beef animals, and only 25 head get to go into the auction because you have to get grand or reserve of you, of that species of that breed and it has to be market beef uh breeding animals do not get included um 2017 was the last time someone got into the purple ribbon auction for the beef um for the beef exhibitors yeah so um it was kind of ex it was a great experience and um it was like once in a lifetime so it was great for uh donations to come in and i'm going to use all that money for college so yeah. um september we had the state shooting sports and wildlife invitational and then this past weekend was the state horse show where all participants did very well. And then we had the state dog show coming up.
All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit um, about our DHS Innovations Inclusive 4-H grant. You've heard me talk a little bit about this in the past when I've come to you, but I wanted to give you kind of an update of some of the activities that we've been doing as part of that and some of the things that we have planned coming up here as well this fall. Um, so our grant originally was supposed to be done in October, um, but with COVID we got a little bit of a late start and we also couldn't jump into it as quickly as we wanted to because clubs couldn't meet in person for the first portion of our grant. So we extended that through the end of May of 2023. So it gives us a little bit longer time frame to use those dollars and be able to show those impacts. Some of the things that we've been doing this spring um, is we went bowling with the Coma Acorns 4-H Club and Megan's Place. Um, that's what the top picture is there and that was a, a lot of fun for our 4-Hers and for their um, youth participants in their group to get to interact and get to bowl um, side by side and have some fun together. Then in May, um, that same club, Coma Acorns, joined with Megan's Place and we attended one of their Special Olympics unified track practices, <clears throat> which was a lot of fun. Um, our 4 Hers had a great time getting to experience all of the different track pieces that those kiddos were um, preparing for because their competition was coming up in a couple weeks after that. In July, we did uh, open swim night at the Hutch Pool, which was a great opportunity again to just have some opportunities for that cross connection and um, opportunities to just engage with people that you might not otherwise. Then in July, um, you heard McKenna share about um, in that one of those first slides about our summer programming that we did weekly visits to Hutchinson's extended school year summer school program. So my intern and I attended um, and had just under 150 kids that we were able to engage with only um, one of those being a current 4-H member. So it was just a brand new audience for us and a new audience that um, hasn't had the opportunity to engage and maybe hasn't um, always been a part of our program. So we went and we did three different projects with them. Um, and between Emily and myself, we split our whole day. We went to um, West Elementary, we were at uh, Park Elementary, we were at the high school and middle school and the transition program. So it was a great opportunity. I know that it was one of my interns' very favorite things that she did in the summer. She was really nervous going into it because she didn't have a lot of comfort in engaging with that particular audience, um, but she did really enjoy it. So it was a, sun, a fun program, and I know that they enjoyed having us come in uh, and do some different activities with them and add some variety to their day while they were at summer school. Uh, also, some presentations that I've done as either individual as part of staff teams. Uh, last April at our annual 4-H staff conference, we presented about the project so far and what we had been doing and shared some resources that we had developed as part of that. And then here in a couple of weeks, at the beginning of October, I will be at um, our extension all staff conference. And we um, were chosen, um, recruited, I guess you would say, by our state 4-H program leader to give one of the two 4-H sessions that are part of that conference on this grant and the work that we've been doing with it. And then um, I always teach at our 4-H staff orientation for all of the new incoming 4-H staff that we have across the state. Um, so I did that in May and I'll be doing that here next week again to just help them to develop some comfort and know what resources are available to them when working with youth with disabilities in their 4-H programs. And then as part of this grant last year while I was on maternity leave, we did a retreat. We're doing another retreat here either uh, mid-October or mid-November. We're still trying to to figure out those dates. Uh, last year we really just targeted our Acoma Acorns here in McLeod and the Awesome Fire Dragons, which is the club in Anoka County that we're working with this grant. This year we're opening that to the whole 15 county central region for 4-H to try to uh, be able to engage a bigger audience now that we're finding some success and we're finding what works within this program. I want to share with you a little bit about why 4-H matters. Um, here's some statistics related to um, why kids should be in 4-H. When you look at youth who are engaged in 4-H compared to their peers who are not a part of our program, um, our 4-Hers are two times more likely to go to college. Um, our girls are two times more likely to pursue a career in science over their peers. Our 4-Hers get two times better grades in school 
They also are 41% less likely to engage in risky behaviors, which means less costs for county in other ways. Uh, they also are 25% more likely to contribute positively to their communities. And part of that is the fact that our 4-H program, a big part of that is community service and having pride and contributing to those around you. 4-Hers are also 2.3 times more likely to exercise and be physically active than their average youth. So a lot of reasons that beyond just the things they tell you about, I get to show my cattle or I get to have fun going to this conference. Um, there's a lot of big picture things that provide a lot of public value to our uh, county and our state as well uh, when we look at you know, why a kid should be in 4-H. I want to give you kind of a highlight of some of the upcoming activities that we have. Um, fall is a very busy time in 4-H as well. I mean, oftentimes people think about county fair, right, in summer and that being our busy time. And yes, it is. Um, but our whole year is, is a really busy time. So fall is kind of a wrap-up time and kind of a kickoff time for the new year. Our new 4-H year technically starts October 1st, so that's right around the corner right now. Um, National 4-H week is October 7th or 2nd through the 8th, which you guys know as you did that proclamation. So we'll be doing a lot of different things um, on social media promoting our program, as well as having um, things where kids can hang locker signs or wear shirts to school, just different ways for them to promote and help um, people around them learn about our program. We also have the National Dairy Conference. McKenna mentioned that she'll be attending that, and that's the first week of October as well. We also have, uh, as we're finishing up our 4-H year, that means we have to do all of our tax forms. So our clubs and our county programs are chartering and doing all of those uh, 990 forms. We also will be transitioning to new officers within our clubs and within the county. Uh, and we will be training those kids in October so that they're ready to fulfill their roles within their club. We also, every year, there's a 4-H annual volunteer training, so that will be happening in October as well. Our awards celebration kind of wraps up um, and highlights everything that happened during the summer, and that's going to be on December 4th this year. And then we'll also have a new club leader training. Um, we have a lot of clubs that are transitioning club leaders this year, so we'll be offering some extra training opportunities for them to be able to feel prepared in the role they're going to undertake with their club. And then we'll also do a new family night in December or January, just trying to help orientate and make those new families comfortable within our 4-H program. And then I also mentioned we're going to have that inclusive 4-H retreat sometime October, November-ish kind of time frame. All right, with that, um, before I open up to questions, I want uh, these girls to share. I know that Shelby shared a little bit about her kind of highlight or something that has been really good for her this year. I want these 4-Hers also to share, and I'm going to put them on the spot a little bit, but I want them to share something that's been really impactful for them this last 4-H year that they've gained. Uh, could be something at county fair or state fair. Could be something within your club. Um, that really demonstrates why 4-H matters and why 4-H is important to you. Um, there's a lot of things. Oh my. I would have to say though my most impactful thing that I've got to experience and go through this year is um, realizing I'm the older kid now. <laughs> um, it's always weird because when I was in the younger position there was all these older kids, especially in the beef barn, and I know Shelby can kind of attest to this. Um, there was always all these older kids in you, and this year it kind of hit me that, oh, I'm the older kid now, and um, it was pretty awesome because, you know, I went to state fair with my sheep. I was actually the only participant that went with sheep this year, which is okay. I'm good at talking. Um, but it was kind of a hit to the chest that I was, you know, the older kid now, but it was awesome because I got to meet all these younger uh, McLeod County 4-H participants and really do what all these older kids did with me and, you know, kind of get them to go talk to people and push them out of the barn and tell them it's okay to go talk to other people from other counties and it's okay to go out of your comfort zone. So I would have to say, yeah, the biggest thing that kind of impacted me was realizing that I am now the older kid. <laughs> So like I said, um, I had the Angus steer. Um, that steer was probably the whole highlight of my whole summer. I've worked with it every single day. And when I got to the state fair, um, I actually got third in my class at the McLeod County Fair. And my heifer actually won everything. So when I went into the state fair lineup, everyone's like, why didn't you bring your heifer in? Why didn't you, why didn't you take your heifer? And I think it was all about my own learning experience. I wanted to take an animal that was purely 
personally mine, and I wanted to show that to people that you don't necessarily need to go out and you don't need to go and buy the new animal. You don't need to have the best equipment. I mean, I think it's all about the learning experience and sharing that knowledge, because once I got to the state fair, it was kind of interesting. I had kids come up and they're like, oh my gosh, is this is this a girl? And I was like, no, it's not. And it's just kind of funny. Um, I had some of them video really record me sh like um, watering or feeding my cow, or them. They will literally be, literally be going to the bathroom, and they will be video recording that. And I'm like, okay, what are you gonna do with that video? But um, it's kind of interesting trying to show them along knowledge. Um, some of them didn't know like why some of them, why all of the cows are different, like the different breeds. I got to explain that to the, some of the younger kids, and it's kind of cool because these are city kids. They're not used to seeing agriculture. They don't know the impact. They don't understand that the food that is at the table is f from these 4 acres that promote so much of that industry. So I think it's so very important for having all these opportunities. So that's, yeah, that's me. I'd again have to say that my biggest impact was helping Nicole this year. I got to walk in the show ring with her and it was just crazy to see how she could still show the calf by herself. She didn't need help. I was just there to support her and to encourage her. And then it was so cool to see that she got a purple ribbon. And her family was so proud of her for all the work she had done because it, all of her hard work did not go unnoticed. And like I said, 4-H gave her the opportunity to do that. All right, something that really impacted me is what I realized at State Fair. So at the end of County Fair, it came across my mind that I was going to be the last one in my family to be in 4-H. And then I realized that, <laughs> this is hard to say, it's past just your immediate family. These guys <laughs> have become my family the entire way through. Yes. I don't know why most of them But it's just super impactful to know that there's still a bunch of family. My friends are my family now, and that's important to me. All right, thank you, ladies. Yes, and that's how we do what we do, right? Um, we make sure these kids have these opportunities to have um, these experiences that are going to be lifelong memories for them, things that are going to be impactful for them, and that help them to be able to develop into adults who are going to contribute and possibly be up here um, and be, you know, important parts of our community. So. Um, with that, I want to just thank you again for the support that you always continually show us as a 4-H program. We're really fortunate, and I always tell everyone that um, we have the best board of commissioners that we could ask for because um, no matter what we come and, and ask you for or say, we know that we have your support, and we appreciate that. Um, with that, I want to open that up to see what questions you may have or if there's anything that you would like to share or ask myself or these 4-H'ers. Um, and again, thank you for your support and allowing us to come in and share a little bit about our 4-H program. Darcy, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you talked about the award program on December 4th. Is that the one that the commissioners are invited to? Yes, it is. Okay. We'll yep. get that on their calendars. For sure. And then for thank the you. girls behind you, because I've been here five years, and I think this is the third or fourth year <coughs> that the four of you have come with Darcy, and we're going to miss mm -hmm. you too. So. And McKenna, I think that there will be lots of right grandchildren in the future. <laughs> Let's the, hope so, right? The 4-H tradition, but Dad uh -huh. needs a couple years break. So, yes. Um, yes. No more making them cry at board meetings, but we're good. Mm -hmm. so we're we're very happy that you take the time to come and see us, and especially, is it all of you? Is, is it senior year for all of you? Uh, Not you, right, Shelby? I'm mm -hmm. You're a junior. I'm a junior. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll see a couple of you still next year, mm -hmm. but thanks for coming. Yeah, we've had a really strong officer team, and one of the cool things with the Federation officers is all of our five officers last year are the same five that they are this year. They just shuffled roles. Um, so, so it's kind of neat to have that opportunity and be able to develop that team and that family that goes along with our program. So um, we have been really fortunate, and we are going to miss all these girls when they eventually are done with 4-H. Um, but, and like you said, hopefully, you know, we'll have some more rights down the road. That'll be a part of our program. Just give your dad a little bit of a, a break in between yeah, there. Um, and that is part of the cool part of our program is we do see a lot of that, right? We see um, a lot of those people that um, are, you know, part of our program generation after generation. I mean, I'm a testament to that. I mean, my kiddos are the same 4-H club that I was in and that my dad was in. Um, so it is a neat opportunity to have um, our 4-H kind of legacy that is an important part of our families here. 
And all of our commissioners really enjoy going to the fair and mm -hmm. supporting 4-H. It's fun to watch. I think that it's like the most important time of them for them during the fair to be on time to the stuff and the <laughs> auction and everything. And I hear a lot about it. And what time are things? Time for <laughs> <laughs> Was it? No, but they really enjoy being involved. So thanks for always mm -hmm. reaching out and including them because Absolutely. we can see that they enjoy it. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, I, I would just echo everything that's been said. It's just it's really easy to support you guys. Uh, I'm, you know, I almost had a tear in my eye because I I, I spent at least four years seeing you back. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're scaring the guys out or not, but I just <laughs> we do have one guy who's part of our officer team. He just never comes to to these. So Julia's brother Timothy is also one of our yes. officers. But I know you're in a team spirit, and and mm -hmm. and you talk a lot about that. But you're. Your individual character and, and integrity really shows, and that's it's it's really easy to be proud of you, and you highlight uh, our great fairgrounds, and I'd also uh, the leadership, uh, Darcy, that you do and the compassion that you have is to be commended as well. It shows you. in in your in your kids. Thank you. Appreciate it. So with that, good job. Ladies, you want to come up? Yes, let's do a photo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, every time we have these, yeah, yeah. I do remember in my years. Yep. They were some of the fun times of my life. Yeah. So. I would agree. I think that's why I still do this. Right? <laughs> nice. You guys look great. All right, right here. One, two, three. Awesome, one more, one, two, three. Here we go, one, two, three, perfect, thank you. Um. Central Minnesota Jobs and Training Services. Barbara, are you ready? Presentation up there. Well, I'm, I'm slowly going here because um, that's going to be a hard <laughs> act to follow. <laughs> Darcy and, you, and your, your team here, amazing, you know. Yeah. I have one question, uh, Mr. Chair, I can, if I could ask. Um, do you have any room for a 110 pound puppy that needs some uh, <laughs> training? <laughs> we do have a dog training program, so if you can find a 4-H or who can the training. There you go. <laughs> it's a Bernice Mock dog, and yeah. she's, she needs training badly. Very needy dog. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome group. I'm, I was so impressed. I knew that um, I'd be in trouble, because <laughs> mine is uh, both, uh, mostly business. Well, um, good morning, everyone, and uh, good morning to Mr. Chair, members of the board, and guests. My name is Barbara Chafee, and I'm the CEO for Central Minnesota Jobs and Training Services, serving 11 counties, including McLeod County. My staff and I are honored to present to you today, and thank you very much for inviting us. Year 2022, and you can, you can keep it on the last one. Year 2022 actually marks our 38th year together as partners in workforce development, supporting members of McLeod County looking for work and local businesses in need of qualified workers. CMJTS serves youth, adults, dislocated workers, MFIP DWP clients, veterans, diverse populations, local businesses, and much, much more. Today you will hear a client's success story from McLeod County and the impact and success of our great partnerships together and Corey will be doing that for me. Um, you can turn to the next page now, or next slide. Today's agenda is really twofold. It's simple. The first part is really about the business part, and if Tricia is on her way here, she got um, side, she got lost. <laughs> so if she doesn't give the annual report, I certainly will. It's the annual fiscal audit under federal law and state statutes, that is my job. Uh, from the Joint Powers Board to make sure that I bring that to you. The annual program performance report, which is in the right-hand side of your black packets. 
And then the commercial insurances, if there's any changes, I, there's one that I want to um, present to you. And then the county demographics by Luke Reiner, and I bring that to you every time because um, the, all the counties have asked for it in the Joint Powers Board. So that's on the right side of your packet as well. You go to any of your extra meetings, at least you've got that, all that data right there in front of you. So. Um, so the second part is really what's happening right here in McLeod County. Next, please. This is the 11 county commissioners that reside on our Joint Powers Board. And I could take time and introduce them all, but I would like to pause for one moment to recognize Commissioner Nathan Schmalz for his outstanding leadership on the Joint Powers Board and his dedication and passion for service to Central Minnesota Jobs and Training Services and the citizens of McLeod County. I wanted to also add that I was born and raised in McLeod County and it's always good to come back home and see all of my commissioners once again. Next, please. This is our uh, map and if you look at that kind of grayish area um, right in the middle, that is the 11 counties that I am the director over um, for workforce development and my staff reside in, in those areas, all those areas. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that Hutchinson is one of our largest sites and we're located in the college in Hutchinson and you can see all of the other 14 sites as well. There's quite a few in this area. Uh, next please. This is the annual report that is um, given to the state. Um, it's uh, the U.S. Department of Labor has to have this and our, uh, also our, trying to think of the other one. Um, and I can't even think of it right now. I'll think of it in a minute, as soon as you switch it. Uh, our bank, that's right. Okay, this is the commercial insurance and it's on the left-hand side, so I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not. But on the very bottom, it says policy type is cyber. And so the Joint Powers Board asked us to increase this to a $2 million, um, and we did that. And I think that it was important, it was appropriate and timely. And thank you to the Joint Powers Board and the county commissioners um, to make sure that, that we're up on this because attacks happen every single day and hacks, especially when they're in your position and mine. So, and the other one would be right in the middle and it's called, um, the policy type is the management liability and that's the director's and officer's liability and that protects Commissioner Schmalz and all of the Joint Powers Board members. So, that's the other one um, that has been raised to two million. We did that a few years ago, but the other one, the cybersecurity is brand new. And Trisha is not here yet, so I can do one of two things, but I think what I'm going to do is going to err because we don't have a whole lot of time. I'm going to do the annual fiscal audit. So um, instead of having the whole book brought here, I just have page 22 out there. So I'm going to be reading off the summary of the, of the auditor's report. The first part of the auditor's report is the financial statements. And I'm not sure if that is the next one, next slide or not. Oh, that's Trisha. I'll just keep moving. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Um, I'm going to do this part first. Um, so anyway, uh, on the fiscal statements, the type of auditor's report was unmo unmodified and the internal controls over the financial reporting were that there were no material weaknesses were identified, no significant deficiencies were identified, and no non-compliance materials to the financial statements were noted. Under the federal awards, uh, these were the major programs. There were no material weaknesses identified, no reported uh, significant deficiencies identified, and the opinion was unmodified. And any audit findings um, closed, disclosed that are required to be reported in a, uh, accordance to, um, with uh, two C CFR 200, there was no audit findings. 
And then uh, the major programs that were reviewed were AMFIP and TANF Youth. And there is a threshold that they have to come in, a third party has to come in, it's 750,000 and we were at about a million. So we had to have a third party uh, auditor, Clifton, Larson and Allen. And then um, the dollar threshold, I already I gave you that one. But the last one is the auditee qualified as a low risk auditee and it was yes. So this means we had another perfect audit for the 16 years in a row, which is almost unheard of in a nonprofit. So we're very excited and very, um, you know, very grateful for that. We have great team, um, they work hard and we're certainly covered in our joint powers board, make sure that they review everything and approve it. So I am going to go ahead and turn this over to, um, I know that we have a short period here, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dina. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Dina Warnes, one of the program managers at CMJTS. If you could advance the slide for me. Uh, one more. And one more. Perfect, so I do wanna just highlight a couple of quick things going on in McLeod County. First of all, um, CMGTS was awarded a grant from the Department of Employment and Economic Development through their Adult Career Pathways grant funding. And we received this funding, we created a program with it called the Pre-Release Training Program. We received $75 thousand dollars for this year through December 31st and then an additional 75,000 for next year and what we'll be doing with that funding we're working with the McLeod County Jail um, including Will Feltman and Hannah and we're putting together programming to help skill up incarcerated individuals provide them navigation services mentorship etc until they release and then we'll work with them upon release to help them with their job search goals um, so that we can try and reduce recidivism here in McLeod County. Next slide, please. The other thing that I wanted to talk about quickly was our SNAP Employment and Training Program. Um, CMGTS does receive two funding streams for SNAP, 100%, which is contracted through the counties. And then we also have 50%. With that 50% grant, we're able to serve anybody in Minnesota who receives SNAP and we can bill back to DHS $50 to continue to um, that program availability. With the SNAP program, we sometimes receive what we call refugee cash assistance individuals. Um, whenever an individual comes into the United States, if they're eligible for that refugee cash assistance, they are referred to employment and training within 30 days to help get them set up in a plan or a pathway that gets them essentially working as quickly as possible once they arrive to the United States. Here in McLeod County, there isn't a specific program for the refugee cash assistance, so what they do is they refer them to our SNAP employment and training program instead. So that's why our success story today was referred to CMGTS and um, found himself working with Corey, our employment specialist in McLeod County. So I'm gonna hand it over to Corey so that he can share the story with you. Uh, so that's a picture of Will. Um, as she just said, he came to a referral through the SNAP program as a refugee. Um, the referral said he spoke no English. And uh, I, I communicated with him uh, via email, because Google will translate that automatically, so that actually worked nice. Very thankful for that technology. Uh, set up an appointment to do the enrollment with him. I uh, had to uh, speak through an interpreter. Uh, very unique experience for me. Um, I'm a very conversational kind of guy. I like to build relationships with people, and this is very much a nuts and bolts conversation because it was just really hard to work through an interpreter. Just quickly realized uh, how that communication can be a barrier really quickly. So I'm thankful that we were able to get that uh, completed. Um, he was basically just waiting for a hard copy of his Social Security card. Um, you know, COVID delayed a lot of that stuff, so he had all of his documentation except for a social security card. So he couldn't work, um, but he was waiting for that. So part of our program obviously is that they're gonna have to do a job search, so he did that intently. Um, but the other thing is, so I, as I spoke with him, I asked him, you know, do you wanna learn English? And he was very eager to wanna learn English. Uh, so it was a, just a great privilege to be able to, we're, we're located in the Ridgewater College, 
walked him down the hallway to adult basic ed, uh, introduced him. They have a Spanish speaking teacher, just started to engage him right away. That day, he sat down and started learning English. It's a computer generated class. He went three times a week until his social security card came and was job searching at the same time. Uh, he has family here. Uh, they, I think uh, many of them work at Millerburn in Winstead and he got a job. This is him at Miller Burn. Um, we, we had another picture. I wish we didn't get it into the slideshow in time, but he's got a full Tyvek suit on and he's spray painting light poles at Miller Burn. So I just thought that was pretty cool. Um, and it was just awesome that he was able to step into that English. Um, I couldn't see him ever because he had a mask on and we were still wearing masks during that time. So just awesome to see his face and he's just eager. When I sent him an email just to ask him a little bit more about his story for this, uh, here's the words that he said. He said, first of all, I came to this country thanks to the help of my father and the U.S. government, <coughs> excuse me, and all the agencies that were helping me throughout the process. Thanks to them, they gave me legal status in this country, which for me means the opportunity of a lifetime where I can get ahead through the help provided for me in this great country, full of many opportunities and work, and thanks that I have my job, there's no punctuation in this, will help me get ahead because my wishes will always be to have my own home, to help my family, and to have, and have and the many people who may need help in this country from him. I reiterate my total gratitude to all the agencies in charge of making all this possible, and of course to the entire U.S. government for giving me this great opportunity. For that I will work hard to that all this to make all this worthwhile, and of course, respect each of the laws of this country. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the opportunity to share that. <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Go ahead. I have a question before you uh, leave oh, the podium. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you, you, know, you highlight Will you know, as an example, and, uh, and uh, hopefully a, a very good employee, yeah. how, do you, um, how do we make sure these people actually get to work? What's their transportation you know, as uh, new immigrants sure. in this country? Um, in this case, he was able to drive with family, so that was an easy solution for him. Uh, if it was a different situation, and this was, I, this was the only one that I've dealt with in this case, so um, we would help them if it was, you know, if we could use Trailblazer or figure out that transportation. That certainly is a barrier, right? If he can't get to work, that's a huge piece of it. In this case, I didn't need to address that. Um, I would have if we had needed to, and we would have figured out a solution somehow to make that work. Okay, thank you. And then, I mean, uh, when it comes to transportation, not just in McLeod County, but with other counties you serve, I mean, is there help out there getting uh, getting uh, these people to their there, job sites? I think there probably could be more. I mean, we want to try to see what do what we ever we can. Um, in rural counties, that's a little bit more difficult just because the public transportation is maybe not as robust as it would be in a metro area. Um, we do what we can. Um, sometimes we offer some gas support, so that might be maybe them finding uh, someone that can help them with that, that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? All right, I'll just wrap up quickly. If you could advance the slide for me. So then I just want to call to your attention some other programs real quick that are available here through CMJTS. Leslie Batowitz is our Workforce Development Division Manager and she works with our businesses in the area. She supervises our business service coordinators. Um, if you could advance the slide for me. So we do have information in your packets. If you want further information on how to serve businesses here in McLeod County, um, either Leslie Watowitz or our business service coordinator here, uh, Bridget, would be able to assist you with that. Next slide, please. And then we have Diana Ristamaki. She is our youth programs manager. There is information for you in your packets on the left-hand side regarding our youth programs, including all of the programs that are available to at-risk youth, ages 14 to 24 here in McLeod County, um, as well as the eligibility criteria for those different programs. So if you will advance the slide, please, one more time. And I believe that takes us to our Q&A session. So. Questions from the board? Mr. Chair, go ahead. If I may, I want to uh, speak uh, to uh, Director Chafee and how she runs um, Central Minnesota Jobs and Training Service. Um, I don't think a meeting goes by when um, Barb isn't in some struggle 
with a uh, deed or, or some other state or federal entity saying that we need that funding in outstate Minnesota. So, you know, our hearts are in outstate Minnesota. I can tell you that Barb's heart is in outstate Minnesota. She's always uh, looking for funding equity so that it gets outside of the metro area. And I just wanted to let the assure the board that uh, you know that's how Barb handles uh, her duties and uh, what she speaks for I think at every meeting that I attend so credit to Barb it comes from the name I just want to say thank you for sharing the story about the young man that works uh, there. I mean, it, we can look at charts and numbers all day, but when you put a name, a face, and a real story, then you know that there's there's something real happening there. So thanks for sharing that. Just to follow up on Nathan's question, Barb, what is what is the struggle to get more? Is it just not enough money, or is it to get a bigger part piece of the pie out of the metro, or what is the real struggle with funding? I can certainly. We have lost over 40% of our federal dollars over the past several years. And even with the Workforce Innovations and Opportunity Act, we were supposed to get a 3% increase every year. Um, it didn't happen. And now it's supposed to be reauthorized again. Uh, there's just many blocks that, that stand in our way. Right now, we're asking for $20 million of flexible dollars so we can serve people that walk in the door. All of the things that we have are, are you know, we've got to use it for So the problem is across the board, not just here in McLeod County. And a lot of, yeah, a lot of the state dollars have, I think, grants, special grants, that have been more focused on and given to the metro area. And so that's why there's, you know, so many things. The greater Minnesota has great needs. It's not just the metro area. So I've been trying to, you know, along with the commissioner, we've been doing our fight just trying Just to my comment, I mean, that's not only in Minnesota jobs and training. There's a lot of different issues with that same problem that we're not getting uh, funding out here, especially, um, again, I'm, I'm an ag guy, but a a ag uh, industry and manufacturing could is very important out here. And there's people interested in coming to the outside for, to the outstate area for more than one reason. There's broadband issues, there's other issues that need funding, but thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the board? All right, thank you for your presentation. Auditor Treasurer Connie, are you ready to go? Good morning, Mr. Chair, members morning, of the board. Good morning. I have two items today. Item A is to consider approval of CD12 services agreement and reestablishment of records by Houston Engineering Inc. The previous services of Houston Engineering Inc. HEI included a survey of 2.4 miles of the public ditch system and a hydraulic memorandum identifying the as constructed grade of the same 2.4 miles of ditch system and the sizing of six culverts within that segment of the system. The scope of services and budget expands this work to a full historic review of the 5.9 mile system. This scope includes a survey of 3.5 miles of the public ditch system, identification of the as constructed and subsequently improved condition for the entire main trunk and two laterals, an engineer's report and a presentation at a public hearing to reestablish the record. HEI's budget does assume the utilization of their previous analysis, and if the board decides to move forward with the repair report, HEI's previous work, sizing six of the 14 culverts along the system, would similarly be utilized. 
Kenny, I noticed that it's referred to as 12 in one, one instance and 12A in a second instance within that first uh, sentence. Which is it? Well, the old records call it 12A, but when it was reestablished, they call it ditch 12. Do you want me to still refer to it as 12A? Well, we just ought to be con con consistent when we talk about it. And is there, if there, is there a 12A anywhere else? No. And I think the account is still called 12A, so. Um, well, whatever it is, it, it is, but we ought to do one or the other. Okay. <clears throat> now, just to be clear on this, um, is there a 12? A CD Other 12. Than, we're talking 12 and 12 a to It's the same Young's system. Point. He's I know, correct. I, know, I, I do know it is too, but I, I, I never. Everything I submitted was CD 12, but then the account is CD 12 a, so when that was looked up, that's what it was referenced. So I'll, I'll correct everything. Okay. okay. Um, I don't want to get too far on the weeds, but th that's that's good. Um, I did. I just comment to the rest of the board. I did make I, when I knew this was coming up. I made several calls to the landowners on the system. Uh, everything, um, um, and I talked with Connie. Um, everything is looked at as as a goal. Uh, they're positive. Want want to get this done so. Okay. Is there any other is there questions from the board? So uh, the motion that I would need is to the, the approval of the service agreement to complete uh, the historic review of the ditch. It's all laid out here from I think three five is done and the rest is five nine. It needs to be done. So move on request, Mr. Motion Chair. made by Commissioner Schmals to go ahead. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Wright. Uh, any more discussion? Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Uh, it seems like we're very consistent with, uh, you know, what we have been doing with our other uh, ditch systems in McLeod County, and that's why I can support the request. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Is that it, Connie? That's it for item A. Item B is the um, summary of the state primary held on August 9th of this year. I wanted to just provide some statistics and some um, discussion for the board. So McLeod County statistics, the 2022 primary, um, our number of registered voters at 7 a.m. was 23,111. Election day registrations were 110. Election day ballots cast were 2,672. Accepted absentee ballots were 312 for a total ballots cast of 2,984. That voter turnout is 12.91% in comparison to the statewide voter turnout, which was 22.28%. So it is lower than the statewide, McLeod is lower than the statewide average by 9.37%. And some considerations for that would be that there were really no runoff races on the ballot in either the county or the city of Hutchinson. Also precincts that changed to mail ballot for the 2020 election cycle during COVID did revert back to in-person voting for 2022. And in McLeod County, the 2022 absentee precincts turnout average was 32.77% compared to in-person precincts of 12.43%. Um, absentee voting. With the transition to the government center, we're now able to have a dedicated room for the 46 days of um, in-person absentee voting. And that's staffed with AT election um, AT staff and election personnel. And many voters who participated did compliment on the room and had a great voting experience. We're able to utilize our space here a little better in the government center than we had at the North Complex. Um, the election personnel, um, we utilize that staff to assist with the election support, such as AB balloting, equipment testing, election judge training, public accuracy testing, and deployment of equipment. The new equipment review for 2022 
we had actually 22 <laughs> new Omni ballot tablets, long word, so I will say OBTs from now on, for use in the precincts as the assistive voting devices. McLeod County received $62,869 in HAVA grants for the equipment. The contract purchase price of the equipment was 101552 and the county paid the remaining balance of 38683 on the equipment. Additional training was held on how to set up and use the OBTs during head judge training as well as public accuracy testing. And deployment and use went well in the precincts. The equipment and process review. Equipment. All DS200 and DS450 tabulators and OBTs are serviced by technicians and tested by county staff with the test deck of ballots. 2022 made a change to utilize our space and increase security. All McLeod election equipment remains at the government center until the day prior to election. Public accuracy testing. All city and township clerks attend to process the test deck of ballots through their DS200 tabulators and they verify the results. Um, in this instance, McLeod does go above and beyond the state requirement, which is at least to test at least three precincts, including one from each congressional legislative county commissioner and school district. We ensure here that those clerks and election teams are familiar with the equipment before election day. And then upon successful testing of equipment, the thumb drives for results are sealed in the DS200s. McLeod County DS200 tabulator was used for direct balloting seven days prior to the election and was kept in a secure location each night with limited access. The DS450 is used for processing mail and absentee ballots received seven days prior to the election and kept also in a secure location with limited access. Election day voting is tabulated on the precinct DS200 tabulators in the precincts. <coughs> Excuse me. And poll pads are used in the precincts. There is no Wi-Fi connectivity possible with the guided access capability, no internet, and limited access to program applications. So how does election night look at the government center? The precincts deliver their tabulated election results, the DS200s, and the paper tapes the election summary statements, OBTs, poll pads, ballots, and all election materials. The poll pad counts are verified and the results are uploaded. The county DS200 and DS450 election results totals are verified and results are uploaded. And then the state transfer files of all results are created on the dedicated election PC and unofficial results are uploaded to the Secretary of State throughout the night as the precincts report to us. We're currently preparing for the general election. Absentee voting does start this Friday, September 23rd, and will go until Monday, November 7th. Additional training for poll pads will be available for judges in October, and election day is Tuesday, November 8th. The polls will be open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Connie, I have a question for yes. our viewers. What are the parameters for absentee balloting for voting? What, what justifies doing that? Anyone can do it or? Well, it's all, you know, within statute. So I just want to make sure, like, if they right. have a question, where should they look or? They can call, call our you. election number. Okay. Um, they also are able to receive reoccurring absentee ballots if they want for each time. They can do that so that they don't have to request them each time. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just think with the pandemic ending, there's still some people who aren't comfortable going out and they would like to know, so. Sure. Thanks. And all of that information is on our elections page on our website. Any questions from for Connie from the board? One comment I do have is I know elections is just getting started. I do work with Connie uh, mostly on water issues, but we do a lot of work on on uh, elections. And I uh, just for the record, I have uh, in her staff and her office. I have uh, great faith in her integrity of uh, of that office, and and I met several of the the people that went through election training, election judge training. Uh, again, I think I think you're on a great ship, but they all seem to be happy with you and your staff and uh, getting the questions answered they need. I mean, every, it's changing all the time and there's always suspect in some of the changes, but uh, I think our people are good. So for okay. what that's worth, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, just in case any of you haven't gone to the updated website, which we replaced earlier this year, 
Connie and Janet did a really good job of providing every bit of information that could be needed on there. So you go to the home page, you can verify your registration right at the home page, and they linked to the state and federal sites so that the information is always updated. So thank you for doing that because it was a lot of work. And so if anyone watching has the internet wants to check that out, you go right to our website, click on government, and it's under elections. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Sheriff's Office. Or did I miss one something more. here? Oh, employee relations. Yep. Sorry, I see you. Nope, not a problem. On. Just a quick one this morning. Good morning. <clears throat> um, item A, consider approval of up to six months of unpaid medical leave for one McLeod County social worker. We will not be filling this position at that time. Motion made by Commissioner Nagel to approve. Um, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Wright. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Excuse me for the mistake there. Now, Deputy Ward, you have the floor. I think it's Chief Deputy Ward. Good morning. Excuse me, Chief <laughs> Deputy Ward. <laughs> I'm here for uh, consider approving the purchase of two 2023 Dodge Durangos at the cost of $41,760 each. One 2023 Dodge Ram 1500 at the cost of 39146 and one 2023 Dodge Charger at the cost of $35,186 from Dodge of Burnsville via Minnesota State Bids. The funds would be from the 2023 Sheriff's Office budget. Total purchase amount of all four vehicles is $158,189. They will replace three 2018 Ford SUVs and one 2015 Dodge Charger. Um, can you just give us a real crash course on how you, how you come up with which cars you want to get rid of? I mean, other than the standard, it's time. Usually it's a four or five year uh, rotation um, typically, the squads have 130 to 150,000 miles. Um, at that point, a lot of the squads are starting to have a lot of issues at nickel and dime us. Um, currently, the 2017s, we only got one um, left. That, well, we got a couple that are still in service, but we're starting to have uh, exhaust manifold issues, turbo issues, um, which can get rather, you know, exhaust manifolds probably about 3,000 to fix the turbo is probably about the same so they just really start to nickel and dime us once we get up into that 120 to 150,000 mile range so good answer I didn't want to put you on the spot but I I mean we you seem to your office does a good job of this rotation but I just wanted to hear yep. some of the reasons and it, it sounded pretty good yeah. any other questions from the board Mr. Chair go ahead and um, if I can address uh, Chief Deputy Ward uh, question, I see that we're, uh, we've got an ask in there for a, a pick truck, right? The uh, Ram, um, and we're replacing um, four squads. Yep. Uh, can you explain a little bit how the pickup truck fit, will fit into uh, your program? Sure, that, uh, it's gonna go into the patrol. Uh, the deputy that would be assigned that does our uh, firearms does their boat and water, so when they go out and haul buoys to the, you know, to put them out, it'd be easy to just to throw them in the uh, back of the truck. It'd be useful if we need to pick up anything up on the side of the road or any big pieces of evidence, so it'll be utilized in that aspect, but it'd be in the patrol unit um, assigned a deputy that uh, would utilize it more. Okay, thank you. Thank you, is there any other questions? Hearing none, uh, board wishes? Move to approve. Motion made by Commissioner Wright to approve. Six Second. seconds by Commissioner Smalls. Uh, any other uh, discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, item B is consider approving the sale at auction of three 2018 Ford SUVs and one 2015 Dodge Charger through Fahey's. These would be the squads that uh, we'd be 
replacing from that purchase. Uh, item B speaks for itself. Yeah. So approve. motion made by Commissioner Wright to approve. Is there a second? Sorry. Seconded by Commissioner Nagel. Is there any more discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. And C is consider approving the sale of a 2017 Ford SUV to the Glencoe Police Department for $7,000. This vehicle was previously approved to be sold at Fahey Auction at the November 16, 2021 County Board meeting. Glencoe has added a school resource officer and would like to utilize this position due to shortage of squads. The last two vehicles auctioned at Fahey sale suffer $8,190 and $6,480. Cost the sheriff's office seven hundred fifty dollars to have a squad turned on for auction. Motion made by Commissioner Nagel to approve the sale. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Smalls. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Thank, thank you. Have thank a good day. Yep, thank you. County administration um, review of calendars. Mr. Wright. Yep, <clears throat> since our last board meeting, we'll start with a uh, budget meeting on the 8th, uh, economic development meeting on the 12th, and uh, department head on the 13th. Those were the main meetings that I've had. Thank you. Uh, my calendars, uh, same, same thing on the 12th, economic development. Uh, proud to have that moving along. It's, uh, it, it's coming well. I, I, I'm appreciative of our staff and their, and their work to get where we are. Um, department head on the 13th, um, an agenda review on the 15th. Uh, I also had, uh, uh, see if I can get these numbers right, uh, Mr. Young, it's CD11, JD11, and now 111, oh, he's gone, but it. it's, it's pretty <laughs> close. <laughs> but at any rate, we have a ditch uh, uh, in the north uh, east port part of McLeod and we've been working on it and it, things are coming together and we had a, f a final hearing of uh, uh, redetermination of benefits and uh, some other issues of joint powers with Wright County. On the 19th and uh, I had several other days and hours in there with, um, with budget reviews trying to work uh, on our budget which brings us to today. Commissioner Nagel. Um, following the last, following the last meeting, as was mentioned, the workshop, a couple different health insurance meetings, as it reflects to uh, the upcoming budget discussions. Also, budget committee meetings. Had a meeting uh, at the fairgrounds reviewing, um, uh, well, reviewing the fair with the ag association and other things. And then yes, the uh, JD11. JD 111 and used to be CD 11 meetings. So that's it. Mr. Smalls. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, since our last meeting, I attended the uh, the 212 ribbon cutting ceremony along with uh, you know uh, Commissioner Kruger and Commissioner Luthens uh, that afternoon. Um, the work is still being done on 212, but I think they just wanted to get the ribbon, ribbon cutting um, out of the way so that uh, you know when that highway's ready to open, uh, they can open it uh, without further delay. On uh, Wednesday the 7th, uh, like uh, uh, Commissioner Nagel stated, I had McLeod Sibley Health Insurance meeting. Um, on Thursday the 8th, I had a CHS um, Joint Powers Board meeting in Hutchinson. On Friday the 9th, uh, Central Minnesota Jobs and Training Service uh, meeting. Uh, luckily, I could uh, attend that by Zoom. And then the uh, following week, uh, again, on Monday the 12th, uh, along with Commissioner uh, Nagel and myself, we had McLeod Sibley Health Insurance meeting, uh, you know, a second time. On the 13th, I attended a meeting, uh, you know, hosted by um, our finance director and administration to um, discuss uh, budget and uh, and um, looking at uh, potential options with our budget uh, in McLeod County that we'll be talking about later. The evening of the 14th, I attended uh, my uh, Burgeon Township um, board meeting. Um, I like to keep a close connection with my townships. So one of the pledges that I made to myself um, being a commissioner was to have a, a better connection 
with our town boards and I believe that I'm accomplishing that um, I'm making sure that I'm available to them and there's a open line of communication uh, between my townships and and uh, and my the office that I hold here and uh, that oh it brings us into uh, yesterday the 19th uh, like what was already mentioned uh, we um, had a meeting uh, with uh, concerning CD 11 and a newly formed uh, CD 111 that uh, we uh, formed with a uh, McLeod Wright uh, joint project dealing with a ditch up uh, north of me um, in the northeast corner of McLeod County. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mike. Do you have anything? Mr. Nothing. I do have, I did skip something. I forgot Mr. Uh, Commissioner Luthens is not here and I attended the MRC meeting by Zoom that was held up at the, um, in Alexandria at the fall conference. Um, I did it, I attended by Zoom um, and some of the topics and there are uh, disparities in property taxes. There's different agenda items that we're looking at. It was um, basically, um, we're looking at uh, uh, agenda or items to bring forward to the legislature uh, uh, come uh, next session. And um, some of them will be continued in the October and November meetings. Um, the only new big news was that Dan Larson, our director is, reti is retiring and he will um, in effect be gone. I believe in his last meeting will be November. Um, and then I did forgot one thing here that uh, a, a number of, I've had a number of contacts on the bicycle path running up through our county roads uh, or our county road it goes up Hennepin and I don't know the number of that county road and it runs up towards the hospital and there seems to be some confusion and I guess trying not to overreact I, I am um, um, going to wait until I get everything back I've got some communication back on how this how this permission to do this how it ever came out it's um, I, there's been two meetings and I seem to be getting conflicted we had one several months ago uh, when the city picked a bicycle path and I thought it was made clear that we weren't interested in interfering with parking and snow removal on on that roadway but this is an I, evidently a new thing that I possibly missed uh, in e different emails that I didn't follow and it's uh, a DOT must be doing an experiment I believe it's a two-month experiment on on, uh, on the information I have right now and so if there's confusion there seems to be some confusion with with garbage because people have to take the garbage out to the middle of the street so whatever confusion there is I I do apologize and we'll look through it and uh, I don't know what data uh, data that they are trying to accumulate uh, on this path but uh, we'll work through it and if if that is not satisfactory if this comes to be too big of an issue we'd have to possibly look if we can't wait till another meeting is have an emergency meeting but I would hope that we can get through this so um, again I apologize for that Sheila Nothing to add. You, uh, I'll move on if that's okay. That would be great. Thank Item you. A under County Administration, consider approval of the 2023 preliminary tax levy. <clears throat> the County Board is required to set the preliminary tax levy on or before September 30, 2022. The final tax levy that is adopted in December can decrease but cannot increase from the preliminary tax levy. The options are shown in the agenda. I am going to uh, 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 lean to my, our budget committee uh, that I know is <clears throat> truly, I'm not exaggerating, been working very, very hard on this budget. It's not it's not a fun job. I've been on that committee, so uh, I'll lean to either Paul or Joe, whoever wants to take it, and, and let us let it get started. Well, Colleen, did you have anything to share? Yeah, I kind of wanted to just go over why we set fine, the levy you. the way we do. We have a fund balance policy that's in place, and 
we have to have no less than five months of operating expenditures for the following years, and that we need that so that gets us through the tax time. So we have to pay all of our bills up until the taxes are collected. Colleen, I'm gonna just say something, and I don't mean to be a smarty pants out of this whole deal, but anybody that's listening, I would have begged that they listen to everything. Don't just pick out words and numbers you don't like. Um, listen to why we do what we do or try to do what we do. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to just kind of give it to you and break it down by category. Um, McLeod County invests 33% of the tax levy into our public safety and, ju and judicial, which includes the attorney, court administration, probation, sheriffs, sentence to serve, and emergency services. So the biggest percentage is to keep our community safe. Culture and Rec, we, we invest 3% into our county parks, library systems, historical society, and other nonprofits within the community that serve our community. Um, conservation is 3% because we invest in the Soil and Water Conservation District to keep our water clean, extension, and environmental services. General government, that consists of all the other offices that support, support the community, administration, assessor, auditor, treasurer, building services, recorder, license center, elections, and other, and veteran services. Highway safety, we invest 15%, and that's to keep our roads and bridges in safe driving conditions. Highway maintenance includes snow and ice control, cleaning culverts and dish ditches, um, smoothing surfaces, and minor service maintenance repairs and traffic services. Health and Human Services makes up 25% of the tax levy. Uh, public health nurses provide vaccination clinics and WIC clinics, and also do family home visiting services within our community. Human Services helps residents with developmental disabilities and mental health issues. They also help residents with general assistance, medical assistance, child support, children's services, child protection. Um, foster care and adult services. And then our debt service makes up 6% of the tax levy and that's to pay back our bond payments on our 2014, 18, and 19 outstanding bonds. And just wanna recap all the expenditures that the budget committee has worked hard to reduce this budget as being presented. Um, so our capital reductions, 75,000 for highway E911 signs, 75,000 for court administration remodeling, 20,000 for emergency management inflatable shelter, 52,000 for fleet vehicles, 85 for information technology, and 227 for building repairs. So this reduced the original budget by 534,000. And there's also been some expenditures that were moved out of the levy dollars into special revenue accounts to be paid for, 90,000 for bathroom remodeling and upgrades, uh, 780 for fairgrounds drainage, and 60,000 for fairgrounds and roof repairs. So that's an additional 930 that was taken out of the levy budget. And then outside organizations, um, we held everybody to the 2022 budget. So that was a savings of 12,330. And then at the last department head meeting, uh, Sheila had asked the departments to take another look at their budgets to see what we could do. And Highway responded with an additional reduction of expenditures of 800,000 for county funded rehab projects. So we have worked really hard to get our budget down to where it is today. Um, I have several options there in front of you from a 1% to a 7%. Now you can set that at any percent you want in between there. These are just to give you an idea of what that cost of the increase would be. So I have a, a tax table there just to show you how it affects like residential, seasonal recreation, ag homestead, and preferred commercial real estate. So I'm just gonna go middle of the road just so you can see where that kind of affects. So if you have a residential homestead that's valued at 200,000, if you do a 5% increase to the levy, which is 1.295 million, um, that would increase their taxes by $52.
So if you can follow along with that, and if you have any questions on this spreadsheet, you can ask me and I can clarify that for you. I also want to note that you don't see that in the um, talking points because we haven't settled our 2023 health insurance numbers yet, but that committee also worked hard to um, find an option that will cost about half of what our um, current insurance would for the increase for renewal. So there's been a lot of effort made um, to get us where we would need to be to have a reasonable tax levy increase. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you to Colleen for her hard work. She's worked very hard on this and our department heads as well in the budget committee. <clears throat> Is there any questions on this? Um, with meeting with the budget committee, we've met several times, obviously been over the numbers as many ways as possible. And in front of you, you have a 1% through 7% um, modeled numbers for the commissioners. And um, I don't know if, if Commissioner Wright, if you wanna go through the numbers or if you would like me to go over the budget committee's recommendation. I guess, I don't know, Joe, do you wanna go Mr. over Nagel? it? Well, I guess, yeah, it's been a process, right? And it's it's something that's evolved. I mean, we just bought squad cars for 2023, appropriately so, but the times have changed where we're, we're trying to predict year years ahead because of supply chain issues, how the world has changed. We did that with uh, um, some highway department equipment. And I think it's appropriate and it's what we need to do. And I just think it's also something we need to realize that everything we do affects, what we did today affects next year, right? I mean, and that's, and that's the honest answer of it. So we need to be diligent and, and responsible in remembering those things. Um, I think we did a pretty good job. Um, I obviously know the recommendation of the budget committee, or at least the one I would propose. Um, and I think we did a nice job getting that to the number where we're at. That doesn't mean it cannot come down more. And I hope and assure everyone that we will try to do that. Um, and that number in my mind is 5.5%. Um, that's not a motion at this point. <clears throat> that is where I'm uh, thinking that we would set the preliminary levy at and work to um, sharpen the pencil and see what we could do to bring that down even more. I think that would meet the needs of the county, uh, provide the services that are required. Again, please pay attention to these percentages that the money goes to. Um, we have 33% to public safety. 25% to health and human services, that's over half. And that's, and we can um, tell, we can go into great detail another day of what that provides, but I think um, there's no fluff there when we're working with those departments. Um, and in the public safety world, which is very close to me, you know, they probably could use some more. But, uh, Paul, I guess, Paul, I'm kind of babbling here, but I mean, the, I mean, that's where I'm at, and that's yeah. kind of what I would think we should start at. I'm not saying that's where we should be at in December by any stretch of the imagination, but we've got to jump off the cliff here at some point. Well, thanks for breaking the ice, Commissioner Nagel, on that. Um, you know, there's always a, a, a few times of the year uh, where it gets pretty squirmy up here, and one of them is setting the preliminary uh, levy, and the next one is when you actually set it in December, because everybody's watching for that number, and of course, what what effects does that make to them? And when we set, we've, this has been a, a very long process, obviously, as, as Commissioner Nagel has indicated, um, and uh, uh, trying to trying to run uh, whether it's the household, the business, or county government in what seems to be over an eight percent inflationary period is is quite difficult, and the county is really not immune uh, to, to inflation, and so that has had a lot to do with this. And and uh, um, you, you you run through the numbers, and and um, it's not picking a percentage and ask yourself is this too high or too low. It's it's what do the numbers tell you that it takes to, to run county government in terms of public safety? Excuse me public safety and the infrastructure and the and the different programs that we have and and it's it's uh, as Joe has indicated the number is twenty seven million three hundred thirty four thousand two ninety four which is the five point five uh, percent um, yes we can pull a road project off we can pull a building repair off um, but it just means that there's another one for next year and and it 
Uh, so by, by picking another, uh, or excuse me, a lower number, it just forces our hand down the road, and that's what we don't want. Um, I think uh, a few of us have been there, done that uh, a number of years ago, and, and then you're really up against the wall. So the goal is to, to find a number that um, maintains the healthy financial integrity of the county uh, for all the variabilities that we have to that we have to go through, and uh, we want to maintain quality services. Um, said it so many times: if we want to do this cheaper, we need everybody to behave. But that kind of sense tends to fall on deaf ears. Um, but uh, um, so I will. Uh, come out of the gate and make that motion then to set it at uh, 27,334,294 for our preliminary uh, levy. It is a 5.5 percent. I'll second it. Motion made by Commissioner Wright to set the preliminary levy at 5.5 and been seconded by uh, uh, Commissioner Nagel. Uh, discussion? Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, yeah, and thanks for the work that has been done, uh, you know, by by staff, by commissioners, um, by department heads, um, uh, trying to uh, work in the parameters, you know, that we've asked them to. Um, I'm not on the budget committee. Um, I'm, I'm listening to Paul and listening to Joe, and um, I just have the question. I I want to keep all options open. I don't want to close any doors. We're setting a preliminary. Will five and a half percent give us some room? I mean, do we have a cushion there going with the five and a half? <clears throat> uh, knowing that we can reduce and will reduce our request come December. The five and a half percent would be to meet the needs for operating expenses and what's planned for 2023. I'm sorry. The five and a half percent, from my understanding, meets the operating needs operating and the needs that are planned for 2023 with the things that we've already removed from the requests of the budget. And I think to answer your question bluntly, it'll create, and I'm willing to do it, but it'll be some very tough choices to go down. Uh, budget committee, could do you want to or do you not want to maybe elaborate on where you did start from and, and that you came down? I, I mean, I've heard Commissioner Wright and maybe you, Commissioner Nagel, talk about the numbers you actually started with, and uh, and and you you brought it down uh, quite a long ways from from them numbers. Yeah, it was double digits. Yeah. We were looking at a 19 percent increase to balance the budget. Now, if we want to balance the budget, it's at 10 percent. So, I think a lot of work got done there to get it from 19 to 10. But to answer your question. Commissioner Schmalls, it'll, and it can be done, but it'll be tough. <clears throat> it'll be some hard choices. It'll be some more intense conversation. But this is, do I have to do it? Yes, I do. But it's not going to be easy. That's the honest answer. All I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I mean, at this point. So taking all that we can unbalance um, without ever policy books. Um, so uh, from there it comes down to where do we have to pull money from that and the service we won't have. And our ability to retire I mean a successful workforce is obviously a component of that. Um, so And I I mean I just like to this is not doom and gloom. I mean, I, I just, it is, um, Paul alluded to, I, I believe it's an 8, 3, 8, 7 inflation rate right now. I just heard some, there are some things are beyond our control. I, I think McLeod County uh, is in good, it, we're good we want to keep it that way. Um, so I, I have a couple more questions. I'd like to finish that thought line. Um, I probably uh, just to run reminds it's a preliminary levy and we're gonna you know there's gonna be I, I, I don't like to I, I call them negotiations here before we set the, the final levy I, I, I worked on it I, I have my own personal feelings about it but I find out 
that I can't pick up here. I wish they worked. Um, so it, um, it's, there's a lot of work ahead. Um, before we get to the numbers, and as, as our administrator alluded to, we are in negotiations. Um, we have different options to work through. And last, not least, we're for one commissioner short today. And, uh, so I don't want to get out in a way, but uh, I guess it comes down to uh, after talking to department heads and, and our talk here, um, I'll be able to support the five. So, I mean, we could talk. We could go around in some circles here. I, I've got some numbers written down. I was the first knee-jerk reaction to, I have my own personal opinion. It should be, and where I'd like it to be. You've got to face the facts. And uh, it doesn't mean we're going to work hard for the next couple of months. But uh, I think... Uh, We've spent a lot of time uh, putting good staff in place, um, and they're doing their jobs. They may not get the results, but sometimes, but they're doing a good job. Same with our budget committees and whatnot. Uh, and I have put them there. I have to test them as well. And this is what it's showing right now. So, again, I can live with that. So, with that, uh, same more discussion. Hearing none, I'll call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Board. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Item B, notification that the final contribution was received from McLeod Treatment Board upon the completion of closing their financial accounts. The contribution to McLeod County was $4,533.53 and to Devereaux and Phyllis. I can't think of Phyllis's last name right now. Chris. Thank you. And Phyllis Chris. You've all met before and they've done a, a wonderful job um, finishing up their obligations with the McLeod Treatment Program. Um, they came here to the Government Center and I had the opportunity to talk to Sue about, um, I said, is there anything that you would like the board to know about what you would like to know with, with those dollars? Of course, they can choose what to do with them, but do you have anything you want to know? Uh, she was just hoping that it would go towards some sort of, something that enriches the community, some sort of community programming or that enriches the population that, um, and I, I was driving by the fairground and I just think, wonder it is that the juvenile work crew, um, so the, and um, Susan and they with all of those plants at the entrance. So that, that is something that gives them a sense of pride, which I know Commissioner Wright and Commissioner Nick talked about before. And that are really for um, reaching the juveniles and work in our community. So thank you. So that those dollars are received. If you have further um, questions, that will start. Item C, notification of board workshop in the board meeting on Tuesday, October 4th, 2022, here at the McLeod County Government Center, 520 Chandler Avenue, North Glen, Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sheila. Yeah. Is there any other things that we may have missed or need to come forward? I do, uh, I do comment that we are a commissioner story just uh, and that uh, Commissioner Luthan, uh, on Car Star in Washington, D.C., the transportation forum, um, uh, the 212 Alliance. And uh, if some haven't heard, um, their 212 was awarded $10 million in federal money for the next day, uh, 212. So that's super, super good moment forward. So hopefully keep it that way. but um that is good news and that's where they are I just i, I neglected to comment earlier that um uh, that's where we're at open forum anything else press relations hearing none the next uh, 
board meeting will be held 9 a.m. Tuesday, October 4th, 2022 at the McLeod County Government Center, 520 Chandler Avenue, North no more business to come for the board for the good of the county. I would take a motion to recess. Move recess. Motion made by Commissioner Schmaus. Is there a second? Second. Second. Commissioner Wright. All in favor. Say aye. 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 We're recess. Media. And uh, we just do things differently. And I've appreciated visiting with you every once in a while, too. You've